All right, thank you all for joining us and welcome to the Hooksbury keynote address and conversation featured as part of the Faculty Center for Ordination Pedagogy's third annual Pedagogy of Justice series. My name is Justin Wright. I am the Anti-Oppressive Pedagogy Specialist with the Faculty Center for Ordination Pedagogy. And it is my delight to be hosting this event for you today. Uh, very quickly before I begin with more about the series, a uh, special shout out to our 2023 keynote speaker, Dana K. Harmon, Dr. Dana K. Harmon uh, in the School of Social Work, but who's also this past year been a faculty scholar for anti-oppressive pedagogy uh, with us and who helped us into uh, choosing and selecting this year's speaker and who without her, this event and others events that we put on this year would not be possible. So special shout out to her and the rest of our FCIP team for that. Now, this series was created to commemorate Bell Hooks and Paolo Freire's continued and inspired contribution to many fields, including justice-oriented values based and values-based teaching. Loyola scholars, educators, and learners are invited to share their experiences with and knowledge of liberatory teaching and learning with emphasis on the lenses of humility, empathy, love, hope, and dialogue. This series contributes to the ongoing global work to inspire pedagogical innovation in the direction of equity, justice, and freedom. Bell Hooks and Paolo Freire's work continues to uplift critical themes of social justice and education, which resonate deeply with Loyola's own Jesuit heritage. Our team sought to choose a keynote speaker who could address their experiences, knowledge, research, or reflections around the educational impact of the key themes from Hooks and Freire's work, particularly humility, empathy, love, hope, dialogue, and liberation. Now, I know that you are all not so patiently waiting to hear from our wonderful keynote speaker this evening, so I'll not take up too much time. But I wanted to give you all a rundown on our plan for today. So uh, after the welcome and announcements I am currently giving at the moment, I will introduce our 2024 keynote speaker who will speak for around 45 minutes. After her keynote address, we will open the room up for about 30 minutes worth of conversation and talk back with our speaker and with the topic she shared with us. Concluding that, I'll promptly release us for the rest of the evening. Uh, that sounds good. Wonderful. Uh, so just a few more notes. Uh, as many of you have noted, this keynote will be recorded and that recording will be posted to our website and sent out through our university and community channels after this, this event. This way our friends and colleagues who were not able to make it today will be able to listen and learn from our speaker as we've recorded this event in the past two years that we have done this. Um, second, I would like for you to just note uh, the Zoom technology ways. So please make sure that you are muted throughout the um, duration of our keynote speaker speaking so as to not uh, cause too much interference with sound. So please just go through and just make sure you're muted as I'm speaking now. Third, we want you to think of this particular space as one that is relaxed and community oriented meaning I hope that we might dispense with the unnecessary holds of formality that might restrict us from co-creating and participating in an event that is open, honest, and transformative. It is a tenet of anti-oppressive and anti-racist pedagogy to level hierarchies and ways of proceeding that disallow us from showing up as our whole unique selves and progressing in betterment and in excellence. In this sense, much like the name progenitors of the series, Bell Hooks and Paolo Freire, we might truly accompany each other in our aims towards justice and change and go against that which would move us away from, as the Jesuit would say, consolation, uh, which is what we know to be good, just and progressive and towards desolation, that which seeks to mire us in frustration and stagnation and negative tradition. In this, I encourage you to utilize the chat during and after our speaker's keynote as a way to connect in community. While the Zoom technology has not yet allowed for us to vocalize for each other, in the easy and undistracting ways we might in a live setting, please use that chat and the reaction functions as spaces to commune and to show the support for our speaker. The chat is your space, as we say in the Deep South, to hoop and holler and carry on, so please do so. And finally, to round out these announcements, I would like to add in a short note on respect and our community guidelines. As this is a community space, it is important to remember that in community, we treat each other with respect and with grace. We're here to honor and learn from our speaker and it is no small feat to get up here and speak in front of a large group of folks, particularly academic folks. So just know that if anything moves into what I feel might be a space of irreconcilable disrespect, I will take it upon myself as the host of this event to handle that challenge accordingly. 
Now, I absolutely do not believe that any of those issues will arise in this space because I'm sure that this group knows how to treat each other with the utmost grace and respect that we would each want to be given. So now uh, it is my great honor to introduce you to our keynote speaker. As a note, I will be reading an extensive bio of Dr. Conway Phillips's because I believe that she should be honored fully for all that she has done and for the good that she has given to us and her community at large. There's a marked history of black women in general and black women in academia in particular, not getting the flowers and accolades they deserve. And often if they do, they do not receive them while they are alive on this earthly plane with us. We will not have any of that today. So buckle up y'all because we're about to shower her with flowers. Understand? Great. Dr. Conway Phillips has devoted her nursing career to reducing health disparities among Black women and increasing nursing workforce diversity. As a nurse navigator for the American Cancer Society, she frequently encountered Black women who were diagnosed with breast cancer at a much later stage than white women. Those experiences inspired her to pursue a PhD degree and conduct her research to further investigate and reduce health disparities among Black women. She began with a comprehensive review of breast cancer screening behaviors among Black women and focused her early research on spirituality as a vehicle for promoting breast health behaviors. As an expert in qualitative research methods, Dr. Conway Phillips was a co-investigator on two major grants to lead the qualitative analysis for the development of the Resilience, Stress, and Ethnicity, RISE, program to reduce race-based stress in Black women at risk for cardiovascular disease. During her interactions with Black women and in her research studies, Dr. Conway Phillips learned that some women did not trust the healthcare system because of the past and present systemic racism. However, the women were open to exposing their true concerns because she is a Black researcher. As nursing faculty, this inspired Dr. Conway Phillips to focus on recruiting more Black nurses into the profession. Dr. Conway Phillips has been recognized as a leader in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and social justice issues nationally. She's a founding member of the Jesuit Diverse Nursing Faculty Network, whose mission is to better support the academic success of racial and ethnic minority faculty to harness the power of networking across Jesuit nursing schools to enhance diversity in academia. She most recently completed the American Association for College of Nursing Diversity Leadership Institute, a competitive year-long intensive development program for DEI leaders in nursing. Dr. Conway Phillips was a founding co-chair of the MNSON Inclusive Excellence Task Force and a member uh, advocate of the Loyola University's Racial Justice, Equity, Anti-Racism, Diversity, and Inclusive Excellence Ready Connect program. Dr. Conway Phillips has mentored undergraduate and graduate students of color. She is a faculty me mentor for the Loyola University of Chicago Empowering Sisterhood, LUCIS program, and is a key leader of the Collaboration Access Resources and Equity Care Pathway, a grant and donor funded access and pathway program for Black and Latinx nursing students in the four year BSN program. She was part of the founding team for the original HRSA grant that created the program and remains actively involved in the faculty membership program team. Dr. Conway Phillips is the associate professor and department chair of the Marcella Neoff School of Nursing at Loyola University, Chicago. She, her research focuses on cancer and health disparities, spirituality and breast cancer screening behavior among black women. And she's had three funded grants for her research, several data-based articles on her research and multiple national and international data-based podium and poster presentations. As an added feature to her bio, Dr. Conway Phillips was in the audience when Dr. Martin Luther King developed, delivered the Progressive Baptist Church Sunday Sermon in 1965 when he began leading the Chicago Freedom Movement. She also marched with Dr. King when he marched along State Street in 1966, and she participated in the rally at Soldier Field on July 10, 1966. The Chicago Freedom Movement was a movement to end slums and improve living conditions for Black folks in Chicago. Dr. Conway Phillips is a graduate of Wendell Phillips High School on the south side of Chicago. She holds a diploma degree from Ravenswood Hospital School of Nursing, an RN BSN from Chicago State University, an MSN and PhD in nursing from Loyola University, Chicago. I've had the pleasure of getting to know and learn from Dr. Conway Phillips over the course of my time here at Loyola. She's been a fixture at all of our events for the Faculty Center, not because she wants to be seen or known, but because she truly believes in the vision of humanization and betterment that we and many of our collaborators aspire to. 
You can find Dr. Conway Phillips at FCIP events, at events for the Office of Institutional Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, at cultural events to support our Black students and other students of color, and events sponsored by the Departments of Student Development, and many, many others. Now, if you know Dr. Conway Phillips personally, what you'll understand is that an extrovert, she is not. This means that she has a way of proceeding that pushes her away from her own comfort zone to not only find community, but to be a force of representation for her peers and our students. You've heard from her bio, she stands as a testament to what it means to not only persevere through hardship, but to learn to thrive and sow that seed into others. And I can say from experience, she has sown that seed to me as well. Now, I've spoken for quite a while, so I'll leave you with a quote of mine uh, from one of mine and Dr. Conway's favorite authors, Toni Morrison, from her novel, Paradise. The quote goes like this. Let me tell you about love. That silly word you believe is about whether you like somebody or whether somebody likes you or whether you can put up with somebody in order to get something or someplace you want or you believe. It has to do with how your body responds to another body like robins or bisons, or maybe you believe love is how forces or nature or luck is benign to you in particular, not maiming or killing you, but if so, but if so, doing it for your own good. Love is none of that. There is nothing in nature like it, not in robins or bison or in the banging tails of your hunting dogs and not in blossoms or suckling foal. Love is divine only and difficult always. If you think it is easy, you are a fool. If you think it is natural, you are blind. It is a learned application without reason or motive except that it is God. You do not deserve love regardless of the suffering you have endured. You do not deserve love because somebody did you wrong. You do not deserve love just because you want it. You can only earn by practice and careful contemplations the right to express it, and you have to learn how to accept it, which is to say you have to earn and learn God. You have to practice God. You have to think God carefully. And if you are a good and diligent student, you may secure the right to show love. That is the end of that quote. Now, if as Bell Hooks and Paolo Freire and Toni Morrison and the Jesuits and St. Ignatius of Loyola himself lead us to understand that love is the practice of justice and justice is the application of freedom and freedom is God embodied and God is goodness all the time and all the time God is goodness. And that too, altogether is the practical application of love. I believe that our 2024 Hooksbury Pedagogy of Justice keynote speaker embodies that practice at her very core. Now, it is my honor and distinct pleasure to stop talking and to finally introduce you to Dr. Regina Phillips Conway. Thank you so much, Justin, for, for those words. Justin and I met yesterday in my office and um, we, we, we talked about this, this presentation and my nerves about doing it and things like that. But I am excited to, to be here today and to talk to you about overcoming and the importance of mentors, waymakers, and influencers in the pedagogy of justice. So I, I want to thank the Center for Ignatian Pedagogy for granting me the honor of keynote speaker for the Hooks Freire Pedagogy of Justice series. I'm especially honored to follow the inaugural speakers Drs. Sidney Curtis and Lillian Carrera, and last year's keynote, and my friend, Dr. Dana Harmon. I also want to acknowledge Justin Wright, who I have come to regard as a friend and who has been instrumental in my being comfortable to talk about my experiences. I want to acknowledge, just, acknowledge Jessica Monsbeck and Bridget Colecchio who I have come to know over the last few years. I appreciate the open dialogue that they have facilitated as members of the FCIP. I also wanna thank everyone in attendance for taking time out of your day to participate in this discussion, especially my colleagues, Drs. Mary Byrne and Georgia Connors and, and other faculty from the School of Nursing. My name is Dr. Regina Conway Phillips, and I'm the department chair and an associate professor in the Marcella Niehoff School of Nursing. I'm an dual alumni of Loyola, graduating with my master's and PhD from Loyola. I'm a tenured faculty and have taught in the School of Nursing for 12 years. 
I'm a qualitative researcher and my research focuses on breast cancer screening behavior and black women, cancer and health disparity and spirituality. I believe in being real with my students, sharing my stories with them and telling them that they're but for the grace of God. Because according to statistics, being raised by a single mother, raised in Wentworth Gardens, a Chicago public housing project, educated in the Chicago public school systems, I should not be standing in front of you with a PhD. I'll share more about my story a little later. When I was invited as the keynote speaker for this third annual Hooks Frary series, I was excited because I was reminded of my initial introduction to these two philosophers during the Hooks Frary book club discussion. So I want to begin by briefly introducing some of you who may not be familiar with Bell Hooks and Paolo Frieri. Beginning with Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks was a distinguished scholar, cultural critic, feminist theorist, and author, and has profoundly impacted discussions on love, race, gender, and class. She was born Gloria Jean Watkins. She adopted her pen name from her great-grandmother, Belle Blair Hooks and she chooses to use lowercase letters to focus attention on her ideas rather than her identity. Her work delves into the intersectionality of race, capitalism, and gender. And her work highlights how they produce and perpetuate systems of oppression and domination. Throughout her life, Hooks wrote more than 30 books, ranging from scholarly works to children's literature, all of which explore themes of love, hope, community, and the necessity of a transformative ethic of love and solidarity in overcoming social injustices. Her quotes resonate with a wide audience, offering profound insights into the nature of our society and ways we can cultivate more compassionate and equitable communities, including in the community of academia. Bell Hooks' words continue to enlighten and challenge us to think more critically about the world around us. One of my favorite quotes from Bell Hooks is, the heart of justice is truth telling sing ourselves and the world the way it is rather than the way we want it to be. More than ever before, we as a society need to renew a commitment to truth telling. Bell Hooks has a philosophy and it's something I believe in and something I advocate in my teaching. I have educational experiences similar to bell hooks. For instance, my elementary and high school were predominantly black with black teachers and black administrators. And these individuals, they cared about us as students, as individuals, as families, and they pushed us to succeed for our own good and to achieve our goals. Moving on to Paulo Freire, he is best known for his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Freire believed that education was a means to build a critical consciousness that would enable people to create changes in their lives. He was one of the key influencers for Bell Hooks. Freire proposed an approach that focused on dialogue in which students become active agents in their own education. Hooks believed that education should be exciting and fun. When education is used as a form of self-development rather than a memory test, students realize that knowledge is power. Freire believed that education needs to be centered upon developing critical consciousness and humanizing learners who then act 
to liberate themselves and the world from injustice, leading to social transformation. So how did they meet? Bell Hooks had followed the teachings of Freire for years because she began to understand that learning could be liberating. She finally met him as a graduate student when he came to her university. They tried to keep her out of the small group because of her feminist philosophy. They had planned to hold a small group of 25 and only invited those 25 to come. One of the other individuals at the school realized that it was wrong to keep bell hooks out of this meeting and gave up her seat to bell hooks. I will talk more about what role that individual played. When she started asking him questions about his philosophy, because all of his writings up to that point were directed toward men, individuals in the audience tried to stop her, but he stopped them and encouraged her to ask her questions to which he answered and endeared himself to her from that point on. Bell Hooks knew what she wanted. She knew the way to achieve it was through education. She believed, like Freire, that education should be liberating and that education, if done properly, should enlighten both faculty and student. They should be learning together as a unit. Now, a little of my history. I always knew I wanted to be a nurse. My high school counselors and teachers were very supportive of whatever I wanted to do, be it art or nursing. They made sure I was enrolled in the courses that I needed to be successful in either area. Art was something I did in my pastime. Nursing was the ultimate goal. I graduated in the top 10 of my class from Wendell Phillips High School on the south side of Chicago. I was accepted at the University of Illinois, Chicago into their pre-nursing program. When I entered the UIC to begin my nursing education, I found, like bell hooks, that knowledge was suddenly about information only, not about relationship to how I lived or who I was as an individual. When I arrived at UIC, all of us from Wendell Phillips High School were enrolled in all remedial classes. No one discussed this with us. We didn't meet with an academic academic advisor to discuss what courses we were we were taking. It was automatic. As a result of one year of all remedial courses, I lost my scholarship. But I did not let that stop me. I withdrew from UIC and I enrolled in a diploma program at Ravenswood Hospital School of Nursing as the only black student and proceeded to work and put myself through school. I was also the only black student in my MSN and PhD programs at Loyola. So I'm used to being the only or one of a few. My mother, Willie Mae Morton, was my first Shiro. She was a single mother with a fourth grade education from Mississippi. She was the daughter of a sharecropper until they came to Indiana. My mother graduated from Wendell Phillips High School with me after attending night school while working full time as a housekeeper at the University of Chicago. She worked hard and retired from the University of Chicago as a lab assistant working in one of the top microbiology labs in the country. I saw her struggle and we were often sitting at the kitchen table doing homework together. Education was very important to my mother. She stressed the importance of getting good grades to earn a scholarship because she could not afford to pay for me and my sister to go to college. I was the first in my family to graduate from college and the first in both my mother and father's families to earn a PhD. My mother taught me to believe that I could accomplish anything I wanted to. She never allowed me or my sister to use the color of our skin 
as an excuse to not go after what we wanted. She worried about us endlessly when we decided to march with Martin Luther King and go to and attend in the audience when he spoke at our church. My mother had haunting memories and trauma from what she had witnessed growing up in the South, but she did not let that stop her. My older sister, who was also a nurse, is my biggest fan and has always encouraged and believed that I could achieve anything I set my mind to. And she still provides that support and encouragement. My childhood best friend, um, Kathy, from when we were six years old, is also a nurse and has been one of my greatest supporters. With this kind of love and support, how could I fail? I couldn't and I wouldn't. Now I'm going to talk to you about challenges for Black faculty in academia. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, Black faculty comprise roughly 6% of all faculty in colleges and universities, despite representing 13% of the national population. Our chances of reaching tenure is smaller and even smaller still is our opportunity to become full professors. I'd like to share some examples of challenges I have faced in my academic career. One of the examples is an incident at a nursing conference. After presenting my research on breast cancer screening behaviors of Black women, I was questioned by a white audience member about why I did not include white women in my study. When I explained that it was, it, it was important to me because although the incidence of breast cancer is lower in Black women than white, the more mortality rate for Black women is two to three times higher than white women. I explained that the majority of the studies about breast cancer screening have been conducted on predominantly white women, leaving a gap in the literature for Black women. And lastly, who better to study this phenomenon than that was having such a significant impact on Black women's lives than another Black woman? I was later approached by a Loyola faculty and told that I should have indicated that I would include white women in my study so that my research would be better accepted. I have not. I was challenged by another faculty when I was granted a tenure track position. I was asked, how did you get a tenure track position? There was one faculty member who didn't speak to me for the first two years after I started at Loyola and actively pre prevented a black graduate student from working with me although both of us focused on breast cancer screening and Black women. Fortunately, there were other faculty at Loyola who did feel, who didn't feel the same way and connected the student with me. And she successfully completed her DMP degree and published her project within six months of graduating. But this was not without harm to her. I have participated in all of the anti-racist activities at Loyola since the beginning, including the anti-oppressive film series. Following one of those films, we were invited to share an experience. I shared the time that a white mother and her daughter who wanted to monitor one of my classes before deciding to attend Loyola came to my class. I had a TA assigned to that class that semester. When the woman and her daughter walked in, I was standing at the podium preparing to start the class. They walked past me to my white TA and said, you must be Dr. Conway and extended her hand for a shake. When the TA corrected her and pointed her to me, the mother turned looked me up and down and told her daughter to take a seat. 
when the class ended, they went back to the TA, shook her hand, exchanged pleasantries, and left the class without ever speaking or acknowledging me. When I finished sharing this story, one of the white male professors that was participating on the Zoom discussion asked me, why didn't you say anything? I asked him, what would you have had me to say to her? Because one thing I knew for sure was that if it was not going to go well for me, had I said anything to that mother, I was on the tenure track and I already knew the pressure was on for me to prove myself worthy. I had been asked by another faculty member, how had I been offered a tenure track position? How was I to respond to such a question? This is the struggle for black faculty. There is always a dual conversation, a battle going on in my head. I'll speak for myself. As to whether you should speak up, say something, or is it better to remain silent and quiet and let it go and live to fight another day? Many times we silence our own voices because we do not want to be accused of being an angry Black woman or being aggressive. We just want to teach, to be seen, to be respected and valued for what we do and who we are. We don't want to have to work twice as hard and yet constantly still have to prove our worth. My friend, Dr. Dana Harmon, during one of our many conversations with each other, um, asked me how I was able to remain hopeful. My response is that I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. My faith assures me that everything that happens in my life, regardless of how painful or how it looks, is for my good. What is for me will be for me. All I have to do is reach for it, believe, do the work, and I will achieve. How did I overcome? So how did I get through these challenges and struggles? Even though I know they are all for my good and strengthen me, I know that I cannot do it alone. When I decided to return for my master's, I had to take the GRE, which I did not do well because I never tested well on standardized exams. I was told by four schools of nursing that I would have to repeat the GRE. And once again, at my interview at the University of Illinois Chicago Circle Campus, I was told you'll never get into a master's program unless you retake the GRE. I thanked her for her opinion and left. I had told each of these women that I refused to retake it because I knew that the GRE did not accurately reflect my ability to successfully complete a graduate program. Loyola was the fifth school that I interviewed, and I was told by Dr. Carol Gold that Loyola looked at the whole person. They were doing holistic admissions before it became a buzzword, and I was accepted. So how did I overcome? I overcame with mentors, waymakers, and influencers. Rather than just giving you definitions, I want to share my definitions and examples so you will know what this looks like. A mentor is defined as an experienced and trusted person who gives another person advice and help, especially related to work or school over a period of time. Besides my mother and sister, an example of a mentor in my life is Dr. Sandra Underwood, who was an instructor at Chicago State University when I earned my RN to BSN degree. She has been a significant mentor in my life for over 40 years. 
if I'm trying to make a decision about my career, she is one of the first people I will call. And she always answers. She was the one faculty who saw me and saw my potential. She always reminded me that I was not finished. And she said, after I earned my BSN, to be sure to find her so that she could write my letter of recommendation when I decided to return to school for my master's. I found her when I decided to seek my master's degree and found that she, in fact, was an alumni of Loyola. When I went back for my PhD, I reached out to her again. When I finished, she reminded me that I was still not done. There was more work for me to do as a Black nurse scientist. She has also put my name forward for opportunities and connected me with people who have helped shape me as a researcher. Another mentor is Dr. Sheila Haas. She and Dr. Diana Hackbarth were my master thesis chairs. Dr. Haas encouraged me to return to Loyola for my PhD and refused to take no for an answer. When I completed my master's, she encouraged me to submit my thesis to the American Academy of Ambulatory Care Nursing. And when it was accepted, she and Drs. Hackbarth, Andrewich, and Gull came to Washington, D.C. and sat in the front row at that conference to support me. She went on to encourage me along every step toward ultimately being elected president of AAACN. Her support was so consistent and so strong, my mother often asked, does she realize you have a mother? <laughs> Others at Loyola who served as mentors are Dr. Lee Schmidt, who was one of my first professors in my PhD program and has continued mentoring me as faculty. Next is Barbara Velser Friedrich, who enlisted me as her research assistant during the PhD program. And Dr. Linda, Linda Janusek, who served as my academic advisor and dissertation chair. Dr. Janusek knocked down barriers to the State Department of Health to get me access to the participants I needed for my dissertation. On to Waymakers. Tara J. Frank defines Waymakers as people who, with a heart to lead, who open doors for those who have been left behind or cast aside, removes the obstacles and barriers and ushers them through to higher levels of contribution, which are very deliberate series of acts. My waymaker that I want to highlight today is Dean Lorna Finnegan. Lorna introduced me to the faculty women of color in the academy, which has been a significant contributor to my development and perseverance in a program in which I am clearly underrepresented. These are Black women and other women of color. They are professors from all disciplines. Through this group, I got to meet Nicole Hannah-Jones, one of my other sheroes. Lorna has opened doors for me to step into a leadership role. She facilitated my participation in the American Association of Colleges of Nurses, Elon, elevating leaders in academic nursing, and the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Leadership Fellowship programs. Lorna has been instrumental in my receiving several awards and recognition. It, she has made ways for me to be seen, heard, and valued. Through Lorna's efforts, there are a team of us involved in the HRSA and privately funded care pathway program that creates a sense of belonging and promotes success for Black and Latino students, including peer, faculty, and alumni mentorship. And most recently, she nominated me 
for participation in the inaugural Damon Legacy Fellowship. Influencers are defined as person who is regarded as an expert within their particular field that also has a steady following. My main influencer, as Justin mentioned earlier, is Toni Morrison. I have read every book she has written, even her children's book that she wrote with her son. I refer to her in the present because her words stay with me and will live in my heart forever. My favorite book is Paradise. It affected me so much that I actually illustrated the book. Her books speak truth to me. I see and hear myself in her books like no others. I recognize the people. I'm familiar with their story. I share their experiences. I relate to every individual in each of her books. Another influencer for me is poet Maya Angelou, and she was also my mother's favorite. So those are my definitions and examples of mentors, waymakers, and influencers. And I thank them all. I thank them each. And what I know for sure is that every incident where the system was set up for me to fail, every moment of invisibility, every slight or micro and macro aggression, others meant it for evil, but God meant it every incident for my good. This I know, and I stand on a solid rock of faith, hope, and love to do what is mine to do, to be who I'm supposed to be. Because no one and no thing and no system can keep from me what God intends for me. So my advice is to allow yourself the grace to be guided and navigated through life and academia by mentors. Proudly walk through the doors, around the barriers, and over walls, or join in the breaking them down or dismantling them with your waymakers. And then when you have overcome, look back and grab someone's hand who looks like you, who has had similar struggles as you. You know who they are. You know, because you can see yourself in them. It's not hard. Open your eyes, look at them, proudly share your story so they know they are not the only one. Encourage them to welcome themselves into any space they desire to be. My welcome and sense of belonging is not in the hands of others. It is within me. The struggle is real, yet it's necessary. If you ever saw a butterfly in a cocoon and you want to help that butterfly out of its cocoon when you see the struggle of it wiggling in the cocoon, that wiggling and that struggle in the cocoon is what fills its wings with blood. Without the blood filling them, the wings won't spread nor dry, and the half caterpillar with wet, under, underdeveloped wings will be stuck in that moment in time, and they will die. I am stronger and have overcome because of the struggles, the ill-intended barriers, the closed doors, and more importantly, I have overcome because of my family, my friends, my mentors and waymakers and this pedagogy of justice. They confirm my right to belong. Struggles produce beautiful butterflies. Pressure creates diamonds and love conquers all. And my last quote from Bell Hooks, 
the academy is not paradise, but looking, learning is a place where paradise can be created. So I thank you all for sharing this moment with me. Thank you so, so much, Regina. That was amazing and deeply inspirational. Uh, and as you can see through the chat, through the chat people are all just, uh, you know, giving you your flowers and your graces for that. Um, there are a couple of things I want to uh, kind of speak to before we get started with the questioning and different things like that. One of them is, I need y'all to understand, I didn't know the fullness of Dr. Uh, Conway Phillips's talk. Uh, and she also did not know my own introduction with that. So we didn't conspire, y'all, with this talk about love and the paradise. She didn't know I was going to uh, bring out that quote from there. So it's just very funny, you know, how these things work, work together. Um, and, you know, you know, how these things kind of turn out that way. Um, so thank you again for, for that and for this space as well. There are a couple of things I want to kind of point to. One is just to, to thank you for a comment on thank you for something that you said in particular. And then I have a question, I think, for you that I think it would be useful to get us started. So just for everybody to know, I'm going to ask, I'm going to talk a little bit, ask this question, and then the question is opened up for everybody. And when that question period opens, please feel free to use the raise hand function on uh, Zoom if you'd like to speak uh, and say what you were saying openly or uh, via voice, or you can put it in the chat and we'll read that and we'll see about navigating those questions as well. Um, the first thing I wanna say is, I really appreciate you um, speaking to, and I put in the chat with, with this kind of love and support, how could I fail, right? Speaking to the notion of it's very hard to be um, what I understand what many of us who look like us in different variations and ways understand is very difficult to be a first. If you've never been a first, you don't really know what it is to wrap your mind around that and what it feels like to have the weight of everybody else who wasn't able to make it to where you are on your back, right? So that for some people that can become really stressful and it can it can you know break some people in different ways and things like that. But I love your your reframe about it, right? Is that all of these things that happened to me that happen around me have made it possible for me to get to where I am, right? And what you look at now is I'm at the great, I'm at this great part. I'm at this good part. And I really appreciate you, you speaking to that. And I also appreciate you speaking to the notion of harm, right? There's this, this kind of uh, idea that what people will call a microaggression, right? The little things, which are things that don't look like uh, what we consider overt racism or those kind of things to be, right? We're all aware of, you know, the Jim Crow South. We're all aware of lynching. We're all aware of what it is to, to have people murdered in the streets and things like that. So oftentimes we feel like, oh, if we're not doing that, we're not aggressing, right? We're not leaning into racism. We're not leaning into discrimination that way. But I love your talk because it reframes those things that we might call micro, but we know are aggressions as the building blocks, the foundation to get to those major aggressions in the first place, right? It's that notion of, um, you know, what we might call a little thing, but this constant devaluing of the work of people of color or of black women in your mind and your brain allows that version of you when it comes time for um, them to get some kind of accolade, whether it's a promotion, whether it's it's tenure, whether it's all of these other kind of things that allows you to get frustrated and to get upset and wonder why you're not where they are or to get upset that they're even there in the first place to ask somebody, well, how did you get tenure? Or to interfere in somebody's promotion or interfere in those kind of things, right? It allows you to have those building blocks to break, to pull that up in your mind, that that's acceptable that that's okay, right? And I just appreciate, again, you noting that that is all harm. All of those things are harm and it just makes the, it just builds the blocks for even greater harm constantly, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I love that because people have a notion of kind of devaluing that sometimes. Um, but, okay, a lot of stuff. I took so many notes about <laughs> what you said. I'm glad we have a recording. Um, uh, just a couple more things. I think that, uh, this notion of waymakers, as you were talking about it, waymakers as the, those which allow us to get over, right? And 
anytime any of y'all have heard me maybe in other things i i love music and particularly um soul and gospel music and those kind of things so i'm thinking about you know how i got over that song yeah and that is um you know clara ward then to Mahalia Jackson, then to Aretha Franklin, then Sidney Poitier, like all of these kind of things. And I think of that song constantly. And the question in the song is how I got over. It. And they say, you know, my soul looked back and wonder. And then there's another part that says, um, and I rose this morning. And she just continues saying that. And I rose this morning. And Lord, I feel like running, right? So it's interesting to kind of hear that with the Waymakers conversation is how you got over it, is how these people help you get over, right? What community and love looks like with that. And then to hear how you have turned that back around, I think is just wonderful. So again, thank you so much for that. Um, and again, as you can see how many people you touched through this and, and even outside of this, even in the chat here. Um, so my question um, is when it comes to this notion of waymakers, right? This mentors to waymakers to influencers that you have not really like that kind of thing. I think that it might be useful for some people to hear what you can kind of uh, distinguish between the notion of a waymaker and an ally, right? Because a lot of people think if they're allies, they're doing the waymaker thing. But I wonder what that looks like for you and what's your definition of that? Yes. For me, allies will stand side by side with you and they will march with you. They will speak with you. They will speak supportive language with you and they will um they will come to your aid for example if you find yourself in a situation where you're speaking and people are coming after you or attacking you with with racist language or things like that they they will step forward and speak up and say this is not acceptable so they will defend you Whereas a waymaker is a person who is already successful, typically, is in a position where they can say, they can look at you or they can be in a meeting where they're looking at potential candidates to move up for promotion through a company. And they have a list of people who they already have identified as those people that they want to consider to promote. And you've been left off that list. A waymaker says, well, where is Regina in this list? I don't see her. And I've, and I know her work. I'm familiar with her work. She should be on this list. A waymaker opens the door and ushers you in and says, it's not good enough for me to just open the door for you, but I'm going to take your hand and take you through here and put you in front of the people that you need to be in front of, the people who need to know you and see you and hear you and value you and know your worth. And they can take you to the next level they can help you accomplish all of the potential that is within you. So a way maker versus an ally, an ally is a person who's, you know, just there to support you. But a way maker takes you to the next level. Yeah, thank you for that. I love how you said a way maker opens the door and ushers you in, right? So a way maker for folks to even understand more. What allies are great, allies are good, that kind of level of support to stand with you. The way makers are those people who, who know and who we know, they have a certain level of power that supersedes us at that point, right? And their power is that of speaking your name into that room, or that power is that of being that hand that pulls you up out of the water or through the door, right? And I, I think it's it's what is really interesting is for people to understand that they may be acting as allies when they should be acting as waymakers. Waymaker. Right? And, and how that actually can look, right? The notion of being able to recognize the power you have in relation to the person you're standing in allyship with. So then how can you then pull that in? So yeah, no, I appreciate that so much. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so I want to go ahead and open it up to the audience for questions that you all might have. Uh, if you uh, would like to speak and ask your question uh, vocally, you can use the raise hand function, uh, which is down in uh, the reactions tab at the bottom of your Zoom, or you can go ahead and pop that question into the chat. Um, and we'll ask it there, and then uh, Dr. Phillips Conway, uh, Dr. Conway Phillips, can then kind of answer that. All right. It looks like. Uh, go ahead, Georgia. Hi, Regina. I'm not going to ask you a question. I just, uh, <laughs> I just want to tell you how proud I am of you, and I've heard all these stories. Um, having been your friend since we started here and sharing a room together, but I just wanted to congratulate you on, on this and thank you for sharing your story to a wider audience and I couldn't be more proud. Thank you. And they started us out in a broom closet <laughs> or a supply closet. But we made the most of it. Yes, we did. I often say they did it for evil, but God meant it for good because he put uh, Georgia Connor into my life and me into hers. I love that. Uh, we have a question in the chat from uh, Megan Garland. Uh, thank you for sharing your journey, Regina. How would you like to see nursing education change to make it more equitable for students and faculty? Well, one of the things that I know is, and it's from the literature, and I just know instinctively that people are comfortable with people who look like them. And if we're to get more Black students into nursing, we have to have more Black faculty who can understand where these students are coming from, understand their struggle understand that they don't have the same background as the typical, quote unquote, college student. And we can relate to them and not sit back and say things like I've heard faculty say, well, if we accept these students into the program, we're going to have to lower our standards or we're going to have to lower our GPA scores to, to accept. And then our program is going to is gonna go down. We've got to get rid of that thinking. We have to change that thinking because it's not true. The truth is these Black, brown students have the same capabilities. They just haven't had the resources that others have had. And black and brown faculty are aware of that. And I'm not excluding white faculty because there are plenty of white faculty that understand that and are working very hard and very diligently to equalize and, and bring equity to the, to, the, um, to the nursing profession and to nursing academia. So... I would say that we just have to keep pushing and we just have to get people comfortable with the fact that, no, these don't look like the typical students and they may not act like the typical students, but there is no reason to believe that they can't become excellent nurses, that they can't go on to become excellent professors and nurse scientists. Because if that were true, I would not be here. Yeah, I love that you said that. And um, I even wonder with from just thinking about your talk, from what you said, too, I wonder if it's even not even getting them to be comfortable. I think it's getting them to understand what it is to push past their comfortability with what ha what, what has been, right? Mm -hmm. Which is inherent, like growth, growth is inherently uncomfortable. Like becoming a better version of yourself is inherently uncomfortable, quite literally getting taller is inherently uncomfortable for our bodies, right? So I think that 
just just thinking about what you said all today that it's even it's not just the becoming comfortable right it's pushing you past that point to where you then become in a space of acceptance um and those kind of things yeah so thank you so much for that And just a reminder for folks, we do have the time. Uh, so please, uh, you have questions, throw them in the chat and you can use the raise hand function. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Dana. Um, good evening. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm out of town, so, <laughs> so I'm on my hot spot. But um, I have not met, and I say Miss Regina in a loving way, because I'm a Southerner. So when you and somebody is endearing to you, you say, you know, miss, but I want to give you respect to Dr. Regina, but just know the miss is because of the love that I have for you. Um, I have not met Miss Regina in person, but she has been a part of all the various programming that we do for FCIP. And through that, I have always learn so much from her. And as she mentioned in her talk, one of the last things I asked her that I've really been struggling with and trying to think about how can I get it, regain it, is this whole level of hope. Um, and so what Miss Regina said, I think it was last week or maybe a couple of weeks ago, yeah. has really had me sitting thinking with that and, and has steered me in this positive kind of trajectory. So I just want to thank you publicly in a larger space for for that, you know, because I was not feeling hope for a long time, as you know. So I want to thank you for that gift. Um, I also want to say that as a, a Black woman in general, but as a Black woman in higher ed, it is always important for me to engage with other Black women in higher ed. And um, I say this also in a loving way, but learn from my elders, you know, who have been doing it and can give even more historical context, right, of what they have gone through. So, you know, Miss Regina knows this, but my mother was a college professor. Um, and I say was because I haven't had her in my life for many years due to her passing away. But she was also from Chicago. She also was from uh, the South Side. And one of the most wonderful things that I've learned about Miss Regina is that my mom also went to Wendell Phillips High School. Yes. <laughs> Wendell Phillips High School turned out some great people, including the likes of Nick. So growing up, I always oh. heard about them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's still that wonderful connection or understanding that no matter where you come from, or where people think you grew up that you cannot achieve. So I always applaud Wendell Phillips High School <laughs> and those like Miss Regina that have come from that, but you are just a wonderful, loving person. And as you know, I have to, if there's anybody I need to meet in person, <laughs> I gotta make that happen. I will get on that plane and make that happen. So thank you for, for today. And as someone who did this last year, I just, I'm just glad that we have this and get to honor you and, you know, and others as well. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've had many long, interesting conversations that I just cherish. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think it's a testament to to how friendship and to how these connections can be formed, even when we're not in person, right? But by nature of us creating an environment where we feel comfortable enough and and courageous enough to share that with each other, even over this, there's something really special about that um, that I love and it's, it's incredibly wonderful. Um, we have Will in the chat asking a question and then uh, Mary Margaret will be right up after Will. But um, Will says, what an incredible talk. I teach psychology of gender and my students are telling me that they're grappling with sexual violence, abortion stigma, repressive gender norms, and more in their daily lives. I want to be there for them in a very real way, but feel the limits of what I can do in my role as faculty. What techniques have you seen to be effective to support students, particularly in large classes? 
or how to encourage students to support each other? What I've, it's just being truthful and bringing yourself and bringing your honest self in front of the students. If they're struggling, if you're struggling with something, you can share that and let them know. Um, when you are in a class and nurses tend to be, can be cliquish and they'll get in a group and they'll, and they'll, and that group is, they think that they're better than others. And this goes on into their professional nurses. I see you nurses think they're better than med surge nurses. ER nurses think they're the stuff. Flight nurses think <laughs> all of this. But when you, I tend to bring it down to everyone's worth. Everyone brings something of value to the table. Even though they're a student, they have valuable experiences that can help each other. Everyone has their life experiences and their worldviews, and they're just as valuable as the next person's. And so I, I let my students know, we're in this together. You can teach me, and I can teach you, but I can't teach what I don't know. So you've got to tr you've got to trust and open up to me and let me know what's going on and we can work through it together. And I find that students will come to my office hours and and want to just talk about things in general. Or they'll come to me because they they're they're first generation and they want to talk to someone else who's gone through that experience of being first generation. And I just find that being truthful and putting yourself out there as a vulnerable person who is there to learn just like they are, who has gone through the, the throes of being students and, and whatever else is going on, share that with them. Be real to them. And that's what I found that has worked for me. I get more student evaluations where students say, I appreciated you sharing stories with us. Stories about my experiences with patients. Stories about my experiences with growing up. Things like that. A lot of times faculty, I find, are afraid they want to keep this this wall between themselves and students. I'm faculty, I'm supposed to be this, this, this all knowledgeable person. If they ask a question and I don't know the answer, I'm gonna say, whoever's got your laptop, let's look this up and let's talk about this together because I don't know the answer. But being real and honest is what I find is the, the best approach to help, the best way to help students. I think that's that's incredibly beautifully put as folks have said in the chat and wonderful. It's that level of understanding. And I've and this is something that the practice that I've been doing, but in knowing uh, in knowing Dr. Conway Phillips over the course of this, learning is a lot more, right? Is that vulnerability is a practice. Right, and it's something that is difficult every day. But allowing a certain level of vulnerability with the people that you are supposed to be instructing, or how I like to think, co-learning and co-educating with, right, is a different space. Of if you show them that you're a real person, they're able to accept what you say as a real person, and that's a level of connection that you have. And it's easier to learn from somebody who you understand as a real person, as opposed to somebody who has made themselves an island so far away from you. And I think that that's, you know, in learning from you and thinking and the, the different conversations and talks we had, that's the difference between what I think a really great educator is and someone who, you know, who may want to be a great educator, but is, is feeling a little barrier in between that is knowing what it is to cross that water. I think that's wonderful. Um, Mayor Margaret has their hand up. 
Uh, first, I want to say thank you, Regina, for today's discussion. And I, I consider myself lucky because you and I had the opportunity to work together so closely for quite a number of years. And, and those were excellent years. So uh, I appreciate that and, and can't even tell you how much I learned from you during that time. But here's my question for you. In my retirement years now, what I'm doing is volunteering for Chicago Public Schools and in, in, in the very early stages, the first grade, uh, second grade. And my question for you is, do you have a suggestion of what I can be doing to help move us in this direction that you described? Um, even though I'm working with students at a very, very early stage. I believe it's never too early to let a student know that they are loved and they are valued. Just being there and giving of your time is important. You may not be around to see the impact that you make, even if it's on one student. That student's going to remember you and that student's going to know that you made a difference in their life. So just be there. Be I, I, I love you, Mary Margaret. I, I love our time working together. I admire you greatly. And you all you have to do is bring who you are. And those students will feel it. They will accept it. And they will remember it and it will make an impression and an imprint on who they are. And hopefully some of them will be Nihawk nurses in the future. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to just highlight in the chat uh, from earlier that I believe I missed just a comment, but uh, Chandra said, thank you, Regina. Your journey in nursing and life are so amazing. Thank you for sharing with us all. I'm fortunate to have crossed paths with you and to get to learn from you. Oh, thank you. And this is from someone who did not plan on being in academia at all. And I share that with Bell Hooks as well. Bell Hooks had no intentions of being a teacher. She only wanted to be a writer. <laughs> and I never wanted to teach. But when I earned my PhD and was looking for a job, I was told, well, if you want to work at a university, you're going to have to teach. So <laughs> I went back and pulled Parker, Parker Palmer's book out, The Courage to Teach. And it was a, it was a, book that I had to read in one of my nursing classes. And uh, when I realized I was going to become faculty, I went back and I read the book for myself. And it had a totally different meaning when I was reading it for myself. Yeah, I think that's always so amazing. It's often the people who never set out to be teachers or educators that then become really amazing ones for folks. And I think there's a level of, of um, I think that vulnerability, but a very realistic uh, space that that comes into, wherein you never set out to do it, but something in you is propelling you toward that. Even if it's a part of the PhD or part of that, the reason you continue doing so um, is something, is a part of those connections that you create. Um, and I really love that. Uh, in the chat, I believe Walter just had to leave, but Walter said, Thank you so much for your story. The influence of God in your life is so hopeful and encouraging, and you are a Shiro. Thank you. Within that, I wanted to ask a question um, kind of about, I think the, because I, I, having known you, I know your connection with spirituality and what that means for you and how it pushes you through. And I wonder if you're comfortable uh, in sharing a little bit of that with our audience here, because part of your own research um, was about and connecting to spirituality in those. So I wonder um, what is the aspect of spirituality that keeps 
propelling you, right? What do you, how does that help you in your life to be uh, a great, not only a great educator and a great nurse and a great teacher and all of these things, but to be that kind of what I know you to be as a mentor, a way maker, and I'm sure an influencer for many other people. Mm -hmm. um, I've just always been a very spiritual person. Uh, I, it, even when I was younger, my mother told me that if you, she would read the Bible to me and my sister. And she said there were some Bible stories that she would get to. She would have to stop reading because I would just get so emotional and so worked up over it. And, um, but I, I just have always known that I'm a spiritual being and that there is something greater than me that's inside of me. The me that I know that the world sees, there's something greater than that inside of me that drives me every day that spirituality gives me the faith to know that anything and everything that's going on in my life is for my good as I said earlier regardless of how painful it is what it looks like how I feel I allow myself to human experience and the human emotions for only a little while and then I pull myself back in and I tell myself this is just a, a test this is just a struggle this is just a stepping stone to something better something greater and I absolutely believe that because I have testimony so many times in my life when that has happened, when I'm trying to make a decision and I'm going, I'm weighing one or two things. And then I step back and I say, okay, why am I struggling with this decision? Let me just go within. And when I go within and I pray and I let it go, and there, there's a saying in, in, in my church, let go and let God. And I turn it over to God and I don't pick it back up again. I don't keep messing with it and saying, you know, God, I turned it over to you, but I, I'm thinking that maybe this might be a little better way to, to get to this. No, when I turn it over to God, I've released it and I've let it go. And then I sit back or I stand back and I watch how God works in my life and how the spirit works in my life. It removes barriers that I didn't even realize were there. It brings about things and, and gifts and joy into my life that I wasn't even aware of. That wasn't even part of the consideration when I was trying to make the decision. And that just shows me that trusting in God and trusting in this spirit and having the faith that I have to know, regardless of what I see, my human eyes see, I know better. And I and and that has never failed me throughout my life. It has never failed me, and I never question it. And that's what spirituality means. I'm led by the internal spirit that's within me who has my best interest at heart. Even when I get in the way of that and do something that, that I shouldn't have done, I still know that whatever happens is for my good. It's, it's, it was supposed to happen. I'm not, I'm not here by accident. I'm here by divine order. And I live by divine order. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I've heard a little bit of that before in our conversations, but 
I, I think it's something that everybody kind of needs to hear to think about in that, you know, spirituality doesn't have to be something as, as stringent as maybe a traditional religion or religious path or those kind of things, right? Some people call it God. Some people call it goodness. Some people call it the universe. Some people call it a calling, right? I think that, you know, what it boils down to for me in a particular level of practice is, um, and you said the quote, let go, let God. There's a song by um, the gospel artist Hezekiah Walker, I think from the 90s, called Let Go, Let God. And it's as soon as I stop worrying, worrying how the story ends, I let go and I let God, which comes down to a level of if I can just be present, right? If I can just be present and still through the challenges that life brings us, because life is going to always bring us challenges. Sometimes they're going to be incredibly difficult. Sometimes they're going to be nuisances, but they're always going to be challenges because life is about movement and growth, not suffering, but how we get over, right? How we push through those kind of things. Right. But that level of presence, I think, is something that um, speaks really strongly to me and I know to, to other folks in the only way that you can get to the next thing, the only way that those uh you know, what people call blessings come to you is if you're in the right place for it and you have to be present to receive those things, right? Thinking of the way makers, right? You have to be present enough for that that hand that's reaching out to pull you through the door. You have to be present enough to take the hand and right. to see that the hand is there to pull you through. So there's a level of accountability, I think, that goes into that. And when we think about navigating that spiritually, I think that that is um, really helpful in how we push through that. Uh, so yeah, thank you for that for the answer. And one that. of my favorite sayings, I have it in my home and I have it on a block in my office is be still. And the rest of that saying is be still and know that I'm God and I'm always with you. So all I if if I'm feeling really upset or feeling something. I, I look at that sign and say, be still and just trust. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, just highlighting a couple of things in the chat as we're nearing the end of our time here. Uh, Lena says, just an FYI, Regina is also an amazing painter. I can attest to that. Yes, yeah, she is. And that level of presence and spirituality, if you ever see any of her paintings, you can clearly see it represented there. Like, she's an amazing painter. Just, I, I knew she had painted, but I was just surprised at how much she underplayed herself and how good she is doing this. It's, anyway, I hope you get the chance to see them. Um, Ye Yin says, 100%, I'm running around with my kids and I had to pull over to type in the chat, amen. I love that, let go and let God, you are a blessing, Dr. Conway Phillips. Um, uh, Dr. Deanna Franco also says, that's right, Dr. Conway Phillips, words to live by. Um, so we got about a, just a few more minutes here. I wonder, is there anything else that you kind of want to, you know, impart with our audience here before we, we head out? Um, just, just to appreciate yourself and what you bring to the world. You are gift to the world. Each one of us is a gift. And we've each been blessed by a unique presence and gift and purpose. And if we trust God and follow our spiritual guidance, we will accomplish what we're here to accomplish. And never worry about what's for you and you reach for something and you didn't get it. It wasn't meant for you. What God means for you, you will have. But just love yourself and appreciate yourself for who you are and what you bring and what you contribute to this world and to the universe. I think those are wonderful words to wrap up our time here. So thank you so much, Regina. Thank you so much uh, for this wonderful talk. Uh, thank you so much for all of the things that you've done and how many lives that you've touched and continue to touch. It's wonderful being able to honor you with, with this particular um, keynote today and to get to do your introduction and to also just hear you speak uh, f throughout your own life and to answer some of these questions too. It's been wonderful. So thank you so much. I hope you feel all of the flowers that are being thrown onto you 
Uh, so I, I hope do. you feel the love feel and adoration. I feel, that all the hugs. <laughs> I feel all the hugs. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. And thank you, audience, for being here and being present today. This has been wonderful. Uh, thank you all so much.